It's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, part of the Weiwene Lecture Series. Uh, we had lots of fun last year uh, determining who to invite, and we were just laughing. Uh, Mashana was like, why did I say yes to coming to Winnipeg in February? And so uh, we were giggling, and uh, I think for a few reasons. One is I want to say uh, Dr. Mishona Gauman is not only an amazing scholar and intellectual, but a friend and a mentor. And I feel really special today to get to introduce her. And her work is quite incredible and influential for those of you that know it. Um, sh she is from the Tonawanda Band of Seneca. Hopefully I've said that correctly. She's an associate professor of gender studies, the chair of and the Chair of American Indian Studies Inter Interdisciplinary uh, Interdepartmental Program. She's the Associate Director of the American Indian Studies Research and Special Advisor to the Chancellor on Native American and Indigenous Affairs at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, she grew up all over the East Coast with home bases in Maine and Upper State New York and traveled um, those paths with her ironworking father. Uh, she began to do Native Studies in her first year at Dartmouth Dartmouth College after taking a Native American literature class that would eventually lead her to Stanford University's interdisciplinary program, uh, Modern Thought and Literature, where she received her PhD in 2003. She went on to be a UB UC president postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley, which would eventually bring her back to California. Uh, for those of you that know, um, Mishana is um, an author of Mark My Words, Native Women Mapping Our Nations. Uh, she has a forthcoming book called Settler Aesthetics and the Spectacle of Originary Moments, Terence Malick's and the New World. Um, she also has some really incredible uh, community-based digital projects, Mapping Indigenous LA, a digital humanities and social science project launched in 2015 that maps the stories of multiple communities in Indigenous Los Angeles. And she has a forthcoming chapter, Community Resilience, Contested Spaces, and Indigenous Geographies. Can't wait to read that one. Um, I also uh, want to point out that she has collaborative projects with Dr. Wendy Teeter, Carrying Our Ancestors Home, and it looks to digital media in order to develop better practices in working with tribal communities as well to improve the flow of information back and forth, particularly on repatriation and NAGPRA issues, uh, which is obviously an American thing because I don't actually know what that is. Nat, say that again? Yeah. Neg, Nagpra, it's almost like my last name. Um, she uh, <laughs> peer reviewed, uh, published in peer reviewed journals such as the American Quarterly, Critical Ethnic Studies, uh, Settler Colonial Studies, uh, WISO, uh, International Journal of Critical Indigenous Studies, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, it is a great honor and a privilege to steal her from California, if only for a night or two, uh, to snowy Winnipeg. So um, please give me a hand in welcoming Dr. Mishona Goman. Sikan, everybody. Hello. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'd like to thank Lorena and Julie uh, for inviting me and for organizing the events and all the staff members. I heard somebody was up till 1.30 last night waiting to make sure I got out of the airport, um, which I did. They arranged a driver, thank goodness. It was very cold. Um, but I, I really appreciate the hospitality that I've experienced so far. And um, I'm just very honored to be part of this series and part of this lecture series. It's um, something that I think that, uh, that every university should have is a series of indigenous scholars to educate. Uh, um, and that's regardless in Canada and in the US. US really needs it though, let's be real. So that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's something I hope to bring. I would also like to thank the original caretakers of this land and the holders of our futurities. And so that becomes very important to me to think about and go beyond the acknowledgement as just a past acknowledgement, but really it's people who hold our futurities. So that I take seriously the charge to imagine indigenous futures. With the current spreading of using um, settler colonial analysis to approach our current exploitive, extractive capitalist conditions, I find the imperative to differentiate from settler colonial studies analysis, that which speaks to how we arrived at the particular condition of exploitation, from that of indigenous studies. That which takes up, which I feel indigenous studies, which takes up, swaddles, nurses, and bursts the visionary practices of imagining new worlds. I will be doing both today, but emphasizing indigenous perspectives as, as um, not as stopping with settler analysis is never enough. 
I will speak to the visual terrains of settler colonialism, terrains that have not been explored enough, but have formed and fomented policy, eco economies, and everyday violence that indigenous peoples experience. These violences are gendered and aimed, and they are attempts to destroy not just indigenous futures, but all of our generations to come. I will address this in three parts this afternoon. Part one, I will briefly critically engage the settler aesthetics that foment the spectacle of settler states that mark us for death and monumentalizing a past of destruction. Part two moves on to how the visual has an everyday effect and how we must be accountable. Part three, I hope to open up the discussion of the use of cinematic geographies to cinematic geographies and also visual geographies and artwork to disrupt the visual terrains of settler colonialism. And this is the killing of the colonial imaginary. So part one, the spectacle. I take up the concept of the spectacle from Guy Debord's early 1967 work, The Society of the Spectacle. I'm not going to pronounce French, Bruno, uh, you can ask him later, um, in what he considers mass media anything but neutral. Since the invention of photography or moving images, Indians have played a central role. This is well-rehashed terrain. Of course, these new technologies were used as tools to relegate communities and individuals as belongings to the past or to subjugate them as violent entities that stood in the way of progress. This is still ongoing. Though 1967 was some time ago, mass media has not changed much in its approach to ra racializing Indians. The spectacle, quote, the spectacle is not a collection of images, DeBoard writes, rather it is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. And it is that terrain of the spectacle that I'm talking about today. How do we think about these images in the mediated relationships that they portray, but also continue to enact? These mediated images are tied to capitalism. They are commodified and fragmented images that distract from the reality and focus on appearances. The appearances have little relation to reality. Michelle Good in the Katsunak collection speaks to the effect of collection of Aboriginal women's narratives on her father's settler family. She writes of the non-acceptance of her very successful mother. Quote, how do these people deal with the cognitive dissonance they must have experienced in the face of brutality visited upon my ancestors? Many of us have these same reactions in our family, right? These cognitive distances. To create a place for themselves in this land, the settlers accepted notions of that success and that venture necessitated the exploitation and destruction of indigenous peoples. I do not believe that these people were inhumane, good rights, thus for humans to act with such inhumanity and carrying out violence necessary to meet their names, a justification was required. Violence without justification is indefensible. So when I take up the visual terrain, which is part of, um, one of my next book, um, I am really looking at how the visual also portrays into creating those destructions through these collection of images. So while DeBoer does not address settler component of the spectacle, I do so here to raise the question of how Native women in particular are perceived as fragmented, unrealistic images with violent and racist results that Good speaks to, as it, as it is and has been with the circulation of images that Native people's dispossession and deaths have been justified. Now, here I show an image, I show you up here, but uh, I show an image of Wendy Star, Red Star's work. I uh, have a link to her homepage here, and she takes all these uh, Harlequin romance novels, and she's done a collection through looking in vintage shops, etc. and she uh, redoes the cover and calls them the White Squaw series. So in here we see this collection of images that she's really addressing how Native women are portrayed in a particular way. So I kind of put that up there to to have us think about uh, resistance to that. Good continues, and that image developed into a worldview that has been conveyed with terrible efficiency by these people to their subsequent descendants who when, who, when pressed, cannot say why they believe the things they believe about indigenous women. So the spectacle accumulates images that do not always cohere. 
The fetishization of Indians and images that proliferate obscures the disjuncture between, say, images of contemporary Indians resisting resource extraction at Standing Rock and that of images uh, as, of Indians as victims in Diane Sawyer's segment on Pine Ridge, right? We have that dissonance. These recent images are contradictory. The spectacle, like modern society, is at once unified and divided, the board discerns. Like society, it builds its unity on its disjunction. The unity of the settler state is found in a circulation of images, the visual terrains it seeks to construct around indigenous lands and bodies. It maps a feeling of settler entitlement to both while it mourns the past in the in settler aesthetics of nostalgia. So here um, in Wendy Starr's uh, work, we <coughs> sorry, we have a close-up of the white squaw, just one I picked. I like this one with her picking her nose. Um, but the, it, it, there's a lot of kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek models that she does here. And then this other one is part of the Four Seasons theory. And we, <coughs> and we can think about the settler pastoral and the aesthetics that are evoked there as well. Um, so that's part one. Part two, though, I want to speak to something else. And this is uh, the harder part of my talk here. So accountability, indigenous futurities, a move towards sovereign mobilities. <coughs> I'm going to begin this section in a way I do not normally begin but it is necessary to move to indigenous futurities for me. But this issue, for me, demands an ethical telling that reaches far beyond what words, especially those often used in academia, like the ones I just used, are able to provide. Let me correct that to the non-passive and say, I am trying not to distance myself from the structures of feeling, learned knowledges that really comprise the way I engage with film, literature, or the world around me. I am trying not to hide behind the distancing words or collections of images. Each time I begin to tell or frame the way state policies immiserate us, Haudenosaunee, Seneca, Indian, indigenous men and women, loss fills the spaces instead. I ruminate on the word mist itself and all its implications in my own life, in the life of others in the settler state. I run over the tracks of the word mist and what that means, what are we not supposed to remember, what is not to be remembered about the lives lost, how is the loss we might feel intentional, and importantly, how does this loss and missing change our kinships? I made the decision to speak to murdered and missing indigenous, indigenous women in this way to hold myself accountable, to not be another academic working on a trendy topic. I do not want to add to the spectacle a set of accumulating entrees into a topic that needs to be addressed and not just highlighted in ways that evoke shock or even more labeling of Native women as victims. Native, Indian, Indigenous, Seneca, women deserve better than that. We deserve better. When I was 10 years old, my father came back from a trip home. We were living near his job site in White, Connecticut suburb outside of Mystic in Old Lyme, Connecticut, while he worked at the PowerPoint plant nearby. I was used to his coming and goings as an iron worker and the storms he would bring, but this time it felt different. He appeared midday, trembling, angry, and devastated. The palpable anger was readable to our young lives. We had seen it and learned it and to read it, learned to read it many times before. They gathered around us, my younger brothers and cousins, to tell us my Aunt Denona had passed of her alcoholism. She was only 31. My aunt, the one who gave me my first petty, gave me my first purse, my first native bling, captured a wild rabbit, helped me to train it and follow me around, played with me, teased me, and protected me, was lost. She was not a cookie-cutting aunt, making aunt, but an aunt who wore a can opener around her neck as she hitchhiked through Maine and beyond, back and forth from our res to the north of us, always returning with not age-appropriate stories to tell me. I loved it, all of it. <laughs> I loved her beautiful brilliance, tough bravado, and fun-loving woman who was a fierce truth-teller in our family. It wasn't always the truth that would wrap you in, in warm blankets, but it was a truth you needed to hear for survival, all our survival. 
I looked up to her and wanted to be the fighter she was, the one who was seemingly in control of her life, what now in indigenous theorizing we might call refusal, thanks to Audra Simpson. At times, uh, at times this refusal is regenerative, at times just refusal to conform to what it meant to be a good Indian woman or a good woman. She is the one whose impact and loss is so great that we still speak about her in whispers. She is my inspiration for truth telling here. She is my accountability. She is the inspiration for my work to disrupt visual terrains that hinder our bodily sovereignty and mobility. I choose the artwork because it tells a story that cannot be contained and brings me to the effective place that inspires resistance against state-sanctioned violence played out disproportionately over the landscapes of US, Canada, and Mexico. Amiseration, as Jody Bird and Audra Simpson used it to comprise a set of panels that's ongoing, it's gonna be at NASA, show up if you like, is just a word of abstraction. I take seriously the charge to think is not just a word of abstraction. I take seriously the charge to think through the effective and quotidian conditions of immiseration and despair. After my aunts, yes in the plural, and my uncles, yes in the plural, murders, it was all individualized in the rumors that floated in the small rural community. Through newspaper accounts and as we met people on the street in, the, in an all too common narrative about the deaths of native people the collection and commodification of previous images of Indians uh, previously ingested by these same people had already marked these deaths as natural outcome of Indian living. They were dismembered, both literally and figuratively, from the everyday we lived as a family, across various spaces and communities, from the res to those spaces not labeled urban or Indian. In many ways, the liminal spaces are some of the most dangerous spaces. Here I admired the important work of the Red Nation that seeks to document in Albuquerque, that seeks to document, name, and provide ground up solutions to this violence, particularly in Gallup. Jennifer Dennettdale's work documenting the constructed violent spaces of border towns along the Navajo Nation also reflects the immediacy of this work and decades of activism working against more deaths. She speaks to the state monumentalizing of Gallup as a drunk Indian town, one that is necessary to assert governance over Indian spaces and justify the numerous deaths of citizens. All this while there's predatory lending uh, for funerals while it's marking those particular deaths, right? The work of Candy Mossett and Joletta Birdbear, for instance, is also important to name as they've been working on these issues for decades with increasing pressure as man camps and resource extraction climb to new heights. These violences move beyond the time frame of the Me Too movement. They are the foundations of this country. These violences that circulate in a collection of images monumentalizing state power on the deaths of indigenous peoples normalizes the everyday violence. Holding myself accountable here, I hope to create a tear in the facade to undo that spectacle. The violence my aunt faced was systemic, if not commonplace and expected. As a child, I felt the impact and learned the dangers of what it meant to be Seneca in various spaces, a point I speak to in my book, Mark My Words. I find Ruth Wilson Gil Gilmore's statement, she writes on carcerality and particularly on anti-blackness and carcerality, that Quote, racism specifically is the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So this is a different form of racism. It takes it away from that individualized processes. This is particularly applicable to the way that the state leaves vulnerable native populations. Indeed, it produces and sanctions their vulnerability through the extra legal productions. In the US, where we were already deemed dead and assuredly not real or viewed as dying, the murders in our family were reduced to personal shortcomings, not the stem root of what led to their deaths. I wonder at times what a border truly means in its separate collecting of statistics, the spatialization that confines our movements over lands while creating an effective map of belonging and exclusion. Differentiating maps, rendering certain bodies as dehumanized and disposable. I know that I am not alone in a lived experience of what it means to grow up Indian in a place that is determined to prove your vanquishing. Lisa Marie Kacha's work, who's a Latina scholar, brings me to think through the question of mourning and its relationship to justice. 
And speaking of her cousin who died a premature death and was later cast in the newspaper articles as a criminal, Cacho relates the impact to her, her family, and the community. Quote, his death was too painful for us to realize that it also validated our social value. The empty space he left behind in each of us necessarily destabilized the value binaries and hierarchies that formed the foundations for each of our lives. Still empty, the space of his absence still holds ruptural possibilities. And it's this ruptural possibilities is why I'm speaking about my aunt. I think here of my aunt's refusals. <coughs> I recognize similarities at play when after my uncle's murders, the newspaper referred to him as a, quote, drinking buddy, naming only his ethnicity as, quote, a Seneca Indian iron worker, and iron worker, whom, he had, um, whom the murderer had invited to dinner after drinking for three days. Later, when this man would be arrested for breaking probation as a result of domestic violence, they would reiterate this and actually name my uncle's blood alcohol level in exact points, not that of the murderers. Admitted murderers. Murder. One admitted murder, but we think there was more. It is the assaults and their repeated patterns, even after death, that make telling difficult in settler context. The pressing need to recuperate their, re their reputations, but simultaneously knowing that a refuting of who they actually are feels wrong. This catch-22 of making our lives valuable to the state is part of the settler structures that map out paths of our complicity in the not telling or recuperating relatives to the ideals of the settler states. That is, to refute that positionality of putting my uncle in that is to at once also try to recuperate him when that's impossible within those particular constraints of the systemic system. Indian deaths mark settler landscapes, noted through monumentalization of historic markers from a plaque on the, on the floor or plaque wherever, or current spaces deemed criminal, including at the scale of our bodies. The death of the Indian is as old as America and Canada's construction of itself. I tend to look at Canada for those, I'll just reiterate what, I, what I've written about before, as co-constitutive settler violences. Um, I never let Canada off the hook. I told 260 students that the other day. And let me tell you, Canada's not kind. <laughs> so they were a little bit in shock. Um, monumentalizing is a marker, one that draws maps of effective belonging and not belonging. This is why it is so difficult to mourn and why I ask questions about how to proceed with talking about this violence. How does value operate? What are other instances where the logic of human value is made intelligible through racialized, sexualized, spatialized, and state-sanctioned violences. Um, I put up this of, of my aunts here. This is my grandfather and my aunts, and this is during the 70s, and when they in all some earlier as well. Um, <coughs> it becomes important for me to also put her in the context of, of my entire family. So, um, what other instances where the logic of human value, what are the instances where the logic of human value is made intelligible through the racialized, sexualized, spatialized, and state-sanctioned violences? Our family's murders were reduced to individual conflict between the damaged individual and deserving um, dispensable victim. The damaged individual being that of the murderer. The murderers were humanized through a depiction of their individual suffering, mostly PTSD in their military service, and um, the effect that would have on them, even though that was in, in Vietnam War. Both men who murdered my uncles were released after only serving five years in jail. This is quite common in the US. My aunt's murderers were not caught. One was, well, after 20 years after the fact because of her high profile, which I won't speak to here. I see violence in all its form as interrelated, a point brought home by those scholars such as Christina Stark, Victoria Sweet, Sarah Deer, Charlene LaPlante, and all those in the um, Katsanek collection of murdered and missing indigenous women, and many others who write to these connections. This is hard for me to speak, but I'm truly inspired by indigenous women I see doing the everyday hard work it takes 
to speak to, organize, and encourage the grounded actions of solidarity activists and land rights activists that ruptured the normalization of suffering against a state that would ignore, vanquish, or itself deny any inquiry into the deaths of murder and missing indigenous native, missing native woman. And this is particularly also true in the US where, where um, people have started funding, particularly at UNM, um, increase into the, into the death such as of Lorelei uh, Sinajni. <coughs> I take up active artist and activist challenge to be brave in our teaching and scholarship, to show what the importance of embodied geographies and collective responsibilities mean, and not just to Native people, but non-Natives as well. I have realized through the process of writing that it takes not just the vigilance of us accounting through statistics, but the vigilance of the truth-telling quality of my aunt. The first and second time I went through this paper, in fact, I consistently used indefinite pronouns to distance the violent act in the people, my people, my loss. How we write, see, and speak to this violence, a violence where the interpersonal and state speak to each other, support each other, and rely on each other to keep dispossession in place is important. We have to recognize that a language of loss performs a racialized function even as we speak to that violence. So again, how do we begin to speak to the violence when you have these collections of images, right? How do we get past the spectacle which makes an appearance but doesn't foment in reality, right? In the way that loss foments in reality in our families. It would not be until years later that I would learn that my aunt Denona's alcoholism originated in the reform school that she was put into. Not because she had committed a crime, but because my grandfather was seen as having too many Indian kids to attend to without a mother. She was a little disruptive. <laughs> my grandmother, a product of the Thomas Indian School, left early on and eventually returned home to Tonawanda years later. This carcerality, was normal, this carcerality of my aunt was normalized through structures of the state, structures that sought to impose nuclear families instead of deep in Indian kinship ties. There, her and the other girls who were there, because of their non-heteronormative sexuality, or because they were caught in mixed racial relationships, would face abuses of all natures by the guards and matrons. This was well known and not told, only in whispers again throughout the town. These girls would be sent from white New England upper class family areas in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and such places to be corrected. They would attend Skowhegan High School in rural white Maine, arriving on a bus uh, from the reform school, a bus they would call the meat wagon. These women were faced with their own settler patriarchy and racism and white supremacy, but the foundation is in the original violence as that school sits so close to the massacre site of Abenaki people. Monumentalized by a plaque, while ongoing violence towards Penobscot and Passamaquoddy are refuted denied, volatile, and erased simultaneously. The school was closed down, this reform school was closed down post-Civil Rights era and post-Virginia versus Loving, but many of the survivors and town people still know this story. My aunt would eventually be released from this reform school. She would be uncorrected and unabashedly pissed off. I would later learn a new tar partial truth about what killed her, that perhaps she did not die of alcoholism. I never questioned my parents' story, the absence of telling us what happened to her before hospital hospitalization and left to die is what I still grapple with. Perhaps it was too painful to tell, I know it was for my father. Perhaps the anger was too explosive, I know it was too much for my father. I found out through a slip in the story, a slip that came through another oral storytelling by my uncle. My relative backed out quickly after seeing my reaction and re returning to the story of the thunder beans he was telling me. The affect of shame, humiliation, and, I must add, respect for the past came into play here. But it's also something more that occurred, and here I return to Cacho, who states that, quote, the act of ascribing legible, intelligible, and normative values to her cousin Brandon's life is inherently violent and relationally devaluing. <coughs> My aunt was no saint, and I liked it that way. As a young Native woman, I did not need any more, any more pressures of respectability politics in my life. And even years later, even now, especially now as I'm an administrator, I especially do not need any more po politics of respectability in my life. 
Katja moves us away from trying to assign value to her cousin's life and instead reflects that perhaps, quote, she failed to remember what he might have been trying to teach her. I do not want to fail how my aunt taught us to live with ferociousness and strength of Seneca woman. I want to embrace the counters of an effective mapping that she laid out for me. The effective map, according to Jonathan Flatley, is tied to melancholia, a loss that produces not just a brooding over absent objects and changed environments. By positioning melancholia, he states that it produces its own kind of knowledge. Watch for Flatley is evidence of the historicity of one subjectivity, indeed the very substance of that historicity. Effective mapping, then, is not a stable representation of a more or less unchangeable landscape. It is a map less in that it sense that it establishes a territory than it is about providing a feeling of orientation and facilitating mobility. So Flatley clearly is not talking about Indians here. He's definitely not. He's like a modernist and, and doing that work. But what I find interesting is that when we talk about the loss, what maps are those teaching us? What are those effective maps that come into play in how we think about our relatives who have been gone missing? And what new maps can we come? What can that teach us about how to move towards indigenous futurities? In the case of American Indians in the United States, this map of melancholia is replaced with nostalgia. A nostalgia that demands our deaths be individualized for our criminal markers adhered to in some weird biogenetics DNA. That is, the naturalization in the U.S. of poverty, alcoholism, and suicide gets dehistoricized and constructed through biologisms. Um, or pitied with no real redress. In Flatley's effective map, he is not concerned with Indians. If so, mobility more than likely would never enter the conversation. In the geographies of our peoples, the reserve reservation is at once criminalized and at once a place of loss, at once a place of stableness. It is a place assigned a value of loss with no future, thus holding us in settler logics of containment. Yet what we see from the visual representations of our artists, our life, vibrancy, humor, that incorporates the modern and traveling ideas of music, television, a dynamic indigenous media, a dynamic indigenous life, that we see on the ground. It's not the spectacle of those images that we saw in the windy, uh, well, she's refuting that, but that I opened up with in the spectacle. <coughs> Here to get to resurgence, a resurging effect of mapping, I propose we modify mobility in this formulation and assert a sovereign mobility that denies these biologisms and these logics of containment. That is, the sovereign body able to travel between reservation, urban, and rural communities to perform that which we have naturally done before the herding of us onto small plots of land, without encumbrance, without hostility, without our deaths. We assert a new map of sovereign mobility, one that does not come through re recuperation of our aunts, but one that comes through accountability to travel however the hell we want in our ability to do so and revel in our bodily sovereignty. So that's what my aunt teaches me, to revel in my bodily sovereignty and to um, hold myself accountable and to practice sovereign mobility. So, part three. Killing the colonial past on the screen. By now, cross-border attention has been drawn to the statistics of rape against Native women. We've all heard this, one in three, et cetera, et cetera. Wind River, a recently acclaimed Hollywood production, took this up in a compelling passion, albeit without contextualizing the massive work that Native women themselves have undertaken since the 1960s to prevent sexual and domestic violence against Native women. It was a huge oversight as white characters dominated screen time, albeit it drove the issue into the further spotlight. What is missing in the film, in this Wind River, this spectacle that, that was on screen, um, is the fact that Sittler structures erase Native identity and set up a jurisdictional maze that makes data hard to collect. Noted in the film is the fact that 86% of rapes are committed outside one's racial group and done so with extreme forms of violence that exceed other populations. Not noted is the right to bodily integrity and sovereign mobility. In the US, the, this, the lack of statistics is problematic from state to state. What is missing is the colonial context of sexual violence and the formation of the state and its policies that make all this possible. 
The spectacle of these statistics and accumulating images distract from the settler structures that contain and continue to make sovereign mobility dangerous. So while there is a proliferation of images, such as Wind River, that have been commodified and fragmented, they present a spectacle rather than a solution to justice. We see no justice. We just see a spe spectacle within the Wind River film. Have you all seen it? Like, it's not a, yeah, kind of, maybe. <laughs> Um, it had big name actors also, so it kind of pulled people in. How might we unsettle the gaze of settler colonialism that even when addressing the deaths and rape of Native women still tends to pathologize Native people? How do films operate to create awareness of the sexual violence against the murdered and missing woman without pigeonholing them as expendable capital? What might be overlooked in viewing the films as purely an activist narrative or um, viewing them only as a depiction of an event to create awareness about this specific and widely publicized issue. How do we move beyond the pity? How do we move beyond inaction? How do the films tell us more about the often overlooked spatial violence that lends itself to bodily harm? In other words, um, what stories are not the most obvious and how, how, and how are they initiated through cinematic geographies? What does it mean that a majority of these films are produced in Canada? And yes, I am fully aware you all get better funding up here and not in the US. But I also think there's a direct intention there as well. Only recently has statistics started to be compiled in the US and that has been met with major roadblocks as categorizations of race and ethnicity vary from state to state, as I said, and often even county to county. And there's different racial conceptions in the census and the way that jails and carcerality that mostly deal with these issues uh, take down statistics. Um, recently, Annette Luchesi, a Cheyenne and a survivor from CSU San Marcos, is working on a GIS map that uses data to document. Um, there's also some big data sovereignty movements in, in the U.S. that are starting to take place, so perhaps this will happen eventually. Again, the lack of funding <laughs> it can be quite difficult. So when I watch the films produced on murdering missing indigenous women or view the amazing inspiring artwork and exhibits, such as what Julie does in her, her work often, instigated because... Um, um, I, I start this because words are just not enough. I feel something. I feel an effective mapping that I will explore here in these particular films. When I view documentaries, with these documentaries, such as Finding Dawn, Stolen Sisters, Highway of Tears, CBC depictions, to other forms of documenting violence in films, such as Rhymes for Young Ghouls, Red Girls Reasoning, Old Schools, Dance Me Outside, any and all of Alan Eastlip Swanson's amazing documentation of state violence, there is an effective quality to the work through the images not contained in a settler aesthetics. In the visual geographic novels emerging in Canada, the real emerges also in the visual cultural production of indigenous peoples. It is an instrumental site in which native feminist knowledge production is key to thinking through the multiple interlocking logics of violence and colonialism. As you can see in the PowerPoint here, there is a mixture of um, of broad landscape shots mixed with scenes in front of monumental buildings in which native bodies occupy and demand justice. The filming of visual and bodily sovereignty cannot be dismissed or disavowed in this work of purposeful editing and compilation. Some of the documentaries I mentioned here are not solely native produced. I think about the courage of women in many of the films to tell the story of loss, and I wonder about the landscape, the place they clearly choose to tell their stories. Janice Akus, the brilliant First um, Nation scholar, tells her story, and I want to think about that. And here's just a couple other ones. Um, and I wanted to just, um, before I get to Janice Akus's story, want us to think about how the landscape shots work. And I just love the intentionality of the directors in uh, encountering, through cinematic geographies, resource extraction and the landscape shots that we see are incredibly important. It, and it creates those connections instead of having divisive places that are divided, such as urban and reserves. Instead, we see them connected through these cinematic landscapes and shots that, that um, we need to begin to address in order to unsettle what we see through the, through the spectacle that's created in settler images. So, and here's just some more that we can see as well. So 
Janice Acuse tells her story, her journey, through various landscapes on a hilltop where once stood her home and through the institutions that made her vulnerable, disposable to, to de premature death, to bring in um, Gilmore again. It is at once a journey through landscapes as much as it is through state-constructed places meant to diminish Native lives. The shot widens and extends well beyond the frame of the camera, eliciting the effective quality of hope. It is not just the words she tells here, the heartbreak of sexual violence and the government tracking that leads to her exploitation, but the wind through the prairie and the consistent and nurturing presence of the landscape opens us up to thinking of the place of the human and the renewal to humanity. The wide shot evokes hope, renewal, and belonging in its own effective mapping. And thinking through the cinematic geographies in the context of settler colonialism, let us consider the way that um, and here I quote, the way that the media represents the geography of the world has consequences for how we come to know that geography, as well as for our actions in relation to the world. Yet like the natural environment, the media environment is taken for granted and is reified as natural. Here I think um, within these shots and within these frameworks or where Native women choose to tell their stories in that direct, uh, capacious way, it turns us to th have to think about the environment differently and with accountability to it. Um, landscape, at, Longkin writes in Landscape as Media and Media as Landscape, um, how to begin to, to think about those particular connections. Akus in this moment of the film's participation unsettles not just through the telling of her story, her journey through various spaces, but using story, media, and the visual space to reoccupy her place of origin. Akus does not just tell her story in a damaged victim-centered porn landscape, um, again, Diane Sawyer, um, surrounded by poverty, or when river, as we see, but she tells it with a purpose, with intent. And the cinematic landscape and placement of the telling is key to understanding how we read and learn to unsee settler occupation. Her telling atop that beautiful mountain top and peaceful hillside calls for a reckoning of state-produced violence. Please note, here I am also not resigning, uh, do not reassign value here or recuperate by calling these healing landscapes though they, they very well could be. But as Diane Million notes in Therapeutic Nations, how we deal with state violence is a perpetual process and it's not a moment in time. It is not done through watching one of these films or two of these films or three of these films. It's a perpetual process and until that process occurs, we cannot get to that place necessarily of healing. So that's so that settler in the settler viewing of these films, not to let that off the hook, just because you know you're still not off the hook. So in watching and teaching the films in my indigenous women in state violence classes, I realized that part of the poignancy told in the media and its impact is not the mere representing of immiserated bodies, but the way kinship, land, and a reevaluation of women who have been lost resist not recuperates, but resists the ongoing settler occupation. The important part of that resistance or resurgence as, as we're in Canada is the way land plays out in the films and the choices those in the film make, the choices the activists make to march across the land. The problem, states Deborah Dockstarter, a Mohawk intellectual who died way too young, um, is that, quote, in the 20th century, Iroquoian woman grapple with the uneasy question of how to think about a world where another culture's mind has superimposed its own intellectual constructs on the landscape and drastically altered how that land looks to us, of how our cultural metaphors and the way in which we connect to land have become reinterpreted and tangled for us by dominant Euro-North American ideology grounded in scientific rationalism, New Age spirituality, and ecological liberalism. We face the, this unsettling fear that in the process of adapting and surviving this assertion of European-based physical and intellectual constructs on the land, that our Iroquoian minds have disappeared along with the cornfields, or at the very least have been wiped clean. By marching, by occupying, by running, by demanding justice, there is a refusal to live with that current state violence. And we see this in a different collection of images than that of settler aesthetics. Uh, settler aesthetics collection of spectacles. Connections are made and patterns are named in film and mobility in urban space. Les Roberts, who speaks primarily to Liverpool as a case study in his book, examines cinematic cartography, 
that which, quote, defines a set of overlapping frameworks that explore the relationship between film practice and their consecutive geographies. For the Sittler geographies of the US, the repeopling demonstrates different affective maps is key. Throughout these films, there are consistent uh, broad landscape shots as seen in the slides here, as well as the geographies of mobility portrayed. When presenting danger of mobility, danger of displacement, filmmakers will represent cars speeding through freeways or highways, the trucks, vehicles of re extractive resources, plow through pristine lands, pulling and debunking settler created and named landscapes. Yet there is a way to resituate this, to not buy into these logics of containment, to begin to see all spaces in Canada and the US as places of indigenous belonging, as spaces of sovereign mobility. At times, the mobility shots are through the marching, a literal embodying of the land through community participation. These cinematic geographies are key to understanding the resistance of these documentary films. Cinematic geographies provide a stable core that many have more of an effective quality than one which may not have come fully to recognize in our viewings. I encourage everyone to look at these moments in the documentaries, to look at the cinematic geographies. It is an aesthetic quality of indigenous filmmaking and practices that is truly powerful and subtly dismantles the spectacle, repositions that which cannot be a commodity. Our bodies cannot be commodities to reframe and resituate. Okay, I'm, I got one more paragraph. Um, <coughs> so I want us to think about that and uh, just to say these films dig deep when I teach and work with them, I am confronted and put out of my comfort zone. Yet it is a productive being out of the comfort zone as I have to think about why I am trained not to tell, not to share myself. In Stoller states, the domains of the intimates are strategic for exploring two related but often discrete understood sources of colonial control. One that works the requisition of bodies, those of both colonial and colonized, and a second that molds new structures of feeling, new habits of heart and mind that enables categories of difference and subject formations. The immiseration, the shame, the humiliation, and dismissed anger are all part of that colonial control. To be clear, at times not speaking is also safety, and I respect that refusal to use Audra Simpson's important term. Refusal is productive. But if I'm to be honest to the effective quality of the films and artwork I'm showing and to my story, I must question and work through why they anger, sadden, and inspire me to do an anti-violence work and then teach and encourage my students to do the same. To conclude, I welcome any, any comments. Let us all think together how we are complicit in the not telling to all come together to use the multiple mediums to address injustice and destruction of our communities, family, I want us to think about the process of telling, what it means, and how effective we might be. I want to create new landscapes and new effective geographies. I contend that these films get us at the heart of visual settler colonialism that relies on deaths in making us responsible for them. Through the disruption of monumentalism, in this case the death and disposal of Native women's bodies, cinematic geographies denaturalize the structures that allow us this ongoing, epi um, this ongoing situation to be excused by societies. These issues must be highlighted without recuperation for our lost relatives in a politics of respectability, nor should they be highlighted in the pathology of native degeneracy that has already caused way too much harm. I want to live by my aunt's ferociousness, kindness, meanness, and her ability to see through the structures that bind us and live clearly with a good mind to speak to them. Thank you. Ah.